Hi there, I'm Emily Knight and you're tuning into The Animator's Blueprint. As a student at Animation Mentor and an inspiring animator, I'm excited to share this platform with you where we meet the heroes of animation from DreamWorks, Pixar, and beyond. Each episode is a new adventure filled with career training advice, creative inspiration, and the inside scoop from the world's top animation studios. Whether you're just beginning your journey or mastering your craft, this vodcast is your gateway to the animation industry. Let's embark on this creative expedition together. Hello and welcome back. This week I am interviewing Arslan. Thank you so much for your time today. Arslan is on London time. I'm on Pacific time. So we really appreciate you coming in and making the accommodation for today. Um, how are you doing today? Oh, lovely. Thank you. I think I could use a bit more sunshine, but I think that's around the corner now for London. So hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah, we're starting to get a little bit more sun over here, but it's still cold at night. So oh. hopefully spring comes a little earlier this year. It's almost there. It's almost there. <laughs> almost. So real quick, um, where are you from? Sure. I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, actually. And um, it's quite interesting because the way... I started the animation is an interesting journey. It, it wasn't immediate animation. Mm -hmm. It was, um, I was, I was grown up. Uh, I, I was, I was, um, yeah, I was raised in a house where my father was doing a lot of, um, uh, electronic engineering stuff and etc. in 1980s. I think he was doing the first, uh, subtitling for, uh, movies and stuff in Turkey oh. with a Commodore 64 electronic board and some coding and some hardware. So I grew up like with computers in 1980s. Yeah. Um, so the reason I say this slightly long winded answer, but if you don't mind, <laughs> it's basically because, um, I was in the computer world and everything, but I, um, uh, yeah, I got, I, I kind of like my first profession actually was compositing. So I was using a software called Flame, Flint Flame Inferno, they used to call them. I think a company called Discrete used Discrete. to own them, but then they sold it to Autodesk. But mm. I was a flame operator, flame artist, as they call it. Um, but I was so much into animation, I start to do uh, more and more practicing myself at home, completely by myself. No school, no training. I'm a self-taught animator, basically. Um, so I have a very, quite a different journey to, to into the animation. Yeah. And when did that start when you started working at or doing it from home? Yeah, it's, it's basically early 2000, I think. So I was, um, I was, I, I, I was already a generalist 3d artist. I was mm -hmm. using Lightwave and a bit on Maya, but I was never into perfect, just character animation. Oh. And one day when I was doing a, uh, uh, little training in one of the post-production facilities. I saw a guy animating in soft image mm -hmm. and I was like, Oh, that's interesting. What is this? And he said, this is character animation. And I was like, Oh, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Like, like that is, you know, this, we're talking, I mean, now I show my age, I suppose, but we're talking about like 2000. Yeah. I suppose it, it was 2000 mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I know it, there was Toy Story and stuff like that, but I wasn't aware how it was perfect. It literally was made. They were made. Yeah. So that kind of made me got into it. And then uh, I started to like, um, back then there was no YouTube or anything like this neither. So it was mm -hmm. all about, um, I can order stuff from amazon.com from States. Um, yeah. Like I remember ordering Toy Story 1, 2 and the supplemental disc. So I watched the supplemental disc and there were animation tests done by Pete Doctor you know, all those oh. great guys. And I was literally copying what they were doing just by eyeball. Oh, that's, is that how you animate? But genuinely, I got into it, like literally just like, like a, um, uh, I dare to say, like a drunk driver, just like walked into it, just yes. like, oh, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> it's just like driving crazy. Um, yeah. Well, no way. You started by yourself with, obviously, the resources that we have now were not back then. That's inc that's incredible. Wow. Now, something I tell I tell to my students a lot because uh, it's a different generation, different time. I know all that, but I think. Sometimes it's so easy to forget how lucky we are now because back then I remember really well, uh, even like there was no free rigs or there weren't that many rigs around. So I was yeah. trying to model and build my own and it was rubbish. Oh, it's just wow. make the amount of resources now is unbelievable. Like, yeah. um, I'm going to show my age again, but even like I remember having a folder on my computer for inspiration mm -hmm. and you, I used to download QuickTime files from a website before it collapses because if so many people downloads a piece of animation somebody did or a commercial because of bandwidth issues the website was crashing so i was trying to download quicktime files and put them into a folder just like an inspiration folder 
you know, no oh, YouTube, geez. obviously, <laughs> that so you can find anything from. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That's incredible. And what style of animation did you start with? What style of animation? I started with way more cartoony stuff, really, because that was what I was enjoying a lot. I was a big fan of Pixar. Uh, that's where I wanted to work. I know I'm not there, but you know, uh, life brings you an interesting uh, path. Hey. And you have a journey, and you end up somewhere. And I'm not complaining. I'm very happy where I am. Uh, it's just a quite an interesting thing because, yeah, it was quite a cartoony reel I had. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you later. I think there's a question which we, we can talk about later. How I got my first job, my first mm -hmm. big job. Yes. Um, but the I remember my having a very cartoony reel, and I ended up being in a in in frame store for a very realistic dog. It's a movie called Underdog. It's not the most interesting movie maybe in the world, but for me it was huge because it was the first time I was going to work on a movie. Um, and I remember it was a very realistic uh, beagle, quadruped beagle oh, that can fly and stuff. I'm like, I hope they don't fire me. Yes. <laughs> so I'm like, I never animated something real before. <laughs> so this is going to be a challenge. Yeah, um, you going to say how difficult was that? Yeah. Yeah, it was quite, it was interesting because I was so happy to do it i really yeah. again like the driving crazy thing is just i just walked into it and then the you know, people were like very nice to me like senior animators or supervisors other people that like oh no it's great but you need to do this to make it look more real and i was like oh okay okay that's yeah. interesting but i was yeah. like a sponge i was absorbing everything i can see and get and you know working in a professional environment which i tell my students a lot i think you should take that opportunity whatever it is because it totally gives you great experience that is very yeah. valuable but on top of that i was feeling very lucky because i was in a company that quite a few good animators and i was looking at the system every day was really getting inspired i was oh that's really cool animation yeah. i want to yeah. do good i want to do even better or whatever like you, you it was fueling me in a very positive yeah. way uh, so yeah there you go <laughs> oh, that's amazing yeah and um what style is your favorite if you, right. have you done, you've done multiple yeah you have i did multiple i did tom and jerry for example even though it was for a live action it was quite cartoony um i did harry potter dobby and creature i did uh, christopher robin where they were had to be very real but also very cute and sweet so yeah. i think my sweet spot lies in somewhere where i can bend the reality a little bit yeah uh, because uh, there, I think there's nothing wrong with any of the styles you prefer and work and enjoy. But personally, I really like stuff like Rocket, where yes, they need to live in a live action environment, but yeah. I can I can bring slightly different performance into it. Or the current project I'm working on, which is Imaginary Friends, uh, mm -hmm. it's called If, uh, with John Krasinski and Ryan Reynolds. And in that movie, we have characters like almost like out of a Pixar movie. So mm -hmm. That kind of that kind of style is where I love the most. I think um, like when you have something really like spider Wars kind of stuff, but in a live action environment, they don't really work well. So exactly. you need to really have that balance. And I think mm -hmm. having that, um, you know, Rocket, Winnie the Pooh, Tigger, um, Paddington, or um, like I said, like If, Imagine Your Friends, those kind of characters, like where I love the most the style. So it's kind of believable, which I'm telling my students a lot. Like, I know I'm a big fan of the reference stuff, but if the reference works, but the most important thing is you need to know and understand how you need to adapt that reference. It's it's not uh, all the time you just like literally copy one to one. You can, but depending yeah. on the character, right? Like for example, on if we have this character called Blue, which is almost like who's almost like seven feet tall, mm -hmm. it's really wide. You can't okay. make exact reference because it's the size is different, right? Or yeah. the face shapes or me to him is very different. So you need to understand how the logic works. So you need to interpret that reference into another character. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a talent and um, experience that comes more and more with, you know, you build that muscle, let me put it yeah. that way, by doing it more and more and more experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something I really like. Like I tell my students, I'm not trying to rotoscope it. I want you to understand the reasons why this piece of reference work. Exactly. Yeah. Essence of it. Yes, mm -hmm. maybe in this assignment, I'm making you get really close because then you can understand why the COG works like that, why the head works like that, or et cetera, et cetera. But if you absorb that and understand that, then you can apply anything. That's that's something I really think interesting because I want I, I tell people, you know, if you look at the movies I work on, I'm not working on something like I don't know, uh, super mega realistic with more cap and stuff like this. So. Yes, they need to live next to a live action human character, 
but they mm-hmm. need to feel believable. And that that's actually exactly. something you really, the, the audience really empathize. Um, yeah, it's like they really have a connection with something believable mm-hmm. and they will, they will care a lot more emotionally with that character. You yes. Know I mean? um, mm-hmm. but yeah. If you let me talk, I think I'm going to talk until tomorrow or something. No, please, please, because now I have more questions. Do you prefer working with live action movies with animation in it versus just all animation? I didn't do many animation movies. I have to say I did a few, not a lot. And I think Mm -hmm. I do have a bit of sweet spot for, uh, sorry, soft spot for both of them different way. For example, something like... Um, like I said, um, Christopher Robin, Rocket. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not a huge Marvel guy, I have to say. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I love Guardians of Galaxy movies, and I worked on the first one, and the second one. I, I didn't do the third one because I was doing If, Imagine Your Friends. But uh-huh. these characters are so close to me because, like, the baby Groot, I was really involved with the designing and um, creating the performance of that character. And that is something I quite love, that something doesn't exist in a real world and you put it there and people love that character. Yes. And fall in love with the performances. And that's something very, it's a challenge that I really enjoy uh, going through. Yeah. Um, another one was like really, I think one of my most favorite movies that I work uh, on is Christopher Robin probably because the I was involved uh, with our head of animation from the beginning for the animation mm-hmm. tests and stuff. And I remember I was, you know, we were doing something like really like the Disney style one and et cetera. But then the director really wanted to have something to make these characters work in a world and the story he wants to tell. Right. And he wanted these characters to feel like worn out toys, played real worn toys. So mm-hmm. now you have limitations, right? Like how are you going to make yeah. a character emote and this and that? But then those limitations become something, a challenge. So rather than getting upset, I feel like, oh, that's a challenge. How I can make this character feel like that without making it squash and stretching, like mm-hmm. fully, you know what I mean? So that's it. Yeah. And I quite like that. And I think there's a huge amount of subtlety goes into these character, these kind of projects and characters where you can have a lot of fun. Maybe it's, yes, maybe it's not like huge motions, but right. it just do a little head turn or an eye dart and it just gives something really different and that's when you get that that just like hits a hits hits a chord on in, in me or whatever like or however you say it in english but like it just yeah. makes you feel like yeah there's something there which he's alive or she's alive well, you can keep alive. going 100 percent. how do you handle the challenges faced when you're given a challenge like that usually people first, get overwhelmed like oh yeah like first i cry and i go to the yeah. toilet i'm like how am i gonna do this this is usually <laughs> internally that's what happens though <laughs> It's like the challenge is like, it's, it sounds it sounds really fun when you go through the thing. But I remember, I was like, I get that note, uh, like, oh yeah, the director, uh, really, uh, Mark Forster, he's a lovely guy. He really want, doesn't want bendy arms or legs and he wants these toy-like and it's like, okay, 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 how are we going to do this? And then you start to talk and brainstorm with your colleagues and your boss. And like, I remember our head of animation, his wife had this toy, 50-year-old teddy bear from her childhood. Mm-hmm. Wow. And we look at that and like, what, it survived. It was really worn out, but how yeah. did it survive? What is this character move like? What, and we noticed that there are discs here. And so it's not like a connected thing. There's a, there's literally a, something stuck into the chest, the arm, and it pivots around just this act. Okay. There are yeah. cheats you were able to do in CG, but then you start to understand and how you move this thing and you move it and... And I remember there was a point we were looking at, I think the teddy bear from the movie AI, Spielberg's movie, there's a teddy bear there, which is like a toy, can talk and move. And mm-hmm. I look at that, and I was like, that looks creepy though. And that's the whole point of it. <laughs> oh. No one a movie like Christopher Robin, right? Like, how are you going to do that more? Inter- and I mean, you start to dig it and dig it, and we did more tests, more tests. And at some point, I remember we did these two tests with Pooh and Piglet, mm-hmm. and they were like both, uh, like, Various, actually, Pooh's animation test was so simple. I think it might be one of the most simplest things I've done in my life. Okay. Life. <laughs> but it hit, hit the director really well because it was like, that, that's it. Because it doesn't look complex. It just looks like a little teddy bear okay. with limitations, yeah. right? Yeah. That's a good point. And then Piglet was like uh, scared as always that in the animation <laughs> test, like looking like that, as <laughs> like this. And our VFX, if I remember, did a little cloth sim 
because he, the director really wants to make these characters look like a toy. Yeah. And even though it was just an ambient occlusion render with no fur, nothing, just grayscale, but you had these fur, um, textures, I'm sorry, deformations like a clot simulation. So uh -huh. when he walks around, you could see that his body- Oh, like, yeah. oh got it, got it, yeah. And he loved that. And that's that was like, okay, now we're onto something. And then you take it from there. And the next challenge is when they told how much is too much, you know, where are we gonna, yeah. it's almost like acting yeah. In animation is, I always say this to my students when I teach the acting class as well, where it's like a dial that you could, you could amp it up, you could turn it down. And it's like, um, you know, you can say the same line, almost like, how are you doing today? Or, you know, you can say, how are you doing today? So it's like, if both of them has the same line, has same maybe energy on a different world, right? And yep. you could, then it's the question of artistic vision of the movie from that comes from usually from a director, obviously, if he's open to find it with you, then you go through that journey together. Um, but one thing is for sure, when you have characters, particularly for the movies I'm talking about, like yeah. very heartwarming movies, like like mm -hmm. I said, Paddington or Christopher Robin, yeah. they really need to fit into that world. Uh, so you can't go really over the top very easily because it's just gonna jar. And yeah. you're not gonna accept that as a character in that world. So um, so yeah, step by step, you, you start with that, the movement tests, you know, in particular, the Christopher Robin, these characters were small. So when they walk around, they can't like, we didn't want them to be um, unbelievable in terms of the speed they run or the speed they yeah, walk. Right. We did like really clear walk and run tests and we measured the speed. And then one thing came out quite quickly, for example, Eeyore was really um, a small, slow character. He's always depressed, right? <gasps> um, so that dictated that the director then realized, okay, then we need to, Ewan McGregor, who is Christopher Robin, uh, has to pick him up and carry him around because otherwise the movie's not going to move forward. So, yeah. and that's what new nice challenges like how is he going to stick in, you know, under his armpit and just like uh, how his arm's going to dangle? Yeah. It's too much. You know, all these questions that you find some of them you can think about, uh, you can think ahead and plan. Mm -hmm. Some of them just going to come to you right in the middle of the production. Yeah. Those challenges. Man, there's so many questions that come out of when you're on a project, on a film. Sure. While you're doing it, you think you have it all figured out, and then it's like, oh, oh man, yeah, whole new question. Now I got to find a whole new answer to that. It's so interesting how adaptable you have to be—not have to, but like how it's adaptable true. the way you—you're onto something. Because yeah. one of the biggest differences between live action, the effects heavy animation movies, and um, character animation movies, and then full CG movies is um, usually full CG movies have a bit better planning because the way they're developed and the studios are doing it, where in live action world, it's usually like, there's a script, there's a producer, he finds a good director or wants di finds a director he wants to work with or vice versa, or maybe it's the same guy, whatever. But they want to work on this movie with you, but then they have a deadline, which is usually a release date. You know, yeah. the so studio thinks that they can make the most money out of that and that day. So you kind of reverse engineer sometimes. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, okay, that's the release date, when they're going to shoot, and this time, I said, how much time leaves that for you for post-production, this much time. So some of the some of the stuff, not always, not because of lack of vision or anything like that, just because of pure chaos or live action mm -hmm. filmmaking, um, and, and you find order in that chaos. And therefore, um, you know, some of the stuff, like I said, you you can really anticipate, and sometimes you just have to be like, okay, I need, we need to fix this. How can we make this? like better and make his character yeah. work. So for example, for Winnie the Pooh, one of the things was a lip sync and that only came out more like later in the show purely because there were other things that everybody was focusing on, the look of it, the renders, how he fits next to a real kid, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, uh, but the lip sync, for example, because the director's vision was like, this needs to feel like a toy. He really yeah. didn't want something too complex with the mouth shapes and stuff. Uh -huh. We really simplified it and it's just, and, you know, in the essence of the lip sync, it's like Muppet Show for me. Uh, yes. Because, like, uh, you know, that really <laughs> read, right? And that's it. Like, if you make the jaw movement right and just a bit of motion and you're good. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is, is a very subjective thing, I think, also lip sync. It's like, um, even for a normal animated character, one person might want to see more shapes. One person might want to see less shapes, mm -hmm. etc. Like, um, I remember doing the test for Star Wars. Um, Force Awakens episode seven uh, with mm -hmm. Maz Kanata with the lady with the goggles, uh, just full of keyframe animation test. And I remember we were digging the animation uh, lip sync. There was a line 
And I remember getting this note, like, no, 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 let's push the lip sync, let's push the lip sync, the bigger shapes, bigger shapes for the mouth. And, it, and it, there is a point that then it breaks, do you know what I mean? So the character feels like she's she's about to kiss someone rather than just say, how are you doing? <laughs> do you know yeah. what I mean? Then <laughs> you, you, you dial back and then you find your baseline and you do yeah. from there. In the Best point, right now. Wow, yeah. When you started animation, is there anything that was done differently then versus what's taught or done now? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, you know what? I have to confess, animation is actually quite similar still. Yeah. In terms of, you have a software that you yeah. can move things around, like translate, rotate, keyframe, graph editor. It didn't change so much. And I didn't do mocap in my life, so I don't, I can't speak for that side of the things. But like, just purely keyframe animation, it didn't change much. The biggest change I can easily say, use of reference or absorbing or uh, breaking down the reference, just like really jump, particularly the last 10, 10 years, 12 years, I would say. Back then, I do remember we, did ha I mean, you always had reference, but I think this, the technology allowed you to get this video, piece of video into Maya a lot closer. And if you have a good performance or something, you can really analyze and get close mm -hmm. to that. Sometimes that helped to get to the finish line faster. If right. you really understand mechanics and if you mm -hmm. have a good reference, how you can really match that reference as close as possible, as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, for example, I do remember not that I don't, I think that when I look at this, it, there's an interesting camp there because particularly something like very realistic creatures or characters, mm -hmm. um, let's say, for example, Lady and Tramp, I worked on Lady and Tramp for Disney Plus, and that one, we had realistic dogs and they can't move around like a cartoon character. So you have to right. look at lots of the video references or real dogs, right? Yeah. And you really have to analyze it. But even that was a challenge because it wasn't a one-to-one -one copy, usually... Mm -hmm. You had to interpret it and make a performance out of multiple yeah. references and stuff like this. Oh, um, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting. Sometimes I remember like there were 40 references on one yeah. shelf to look at with the animators. And it's like, I mean, maybe we can use a bit of this. And for that emotion, we can use the eyebr um, ears going up like that. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a mix match kind of thing. But mm -hmm. usually more character oriented stuff, which I enjoy doing a lot, is um, you really have to either like get a good reference and i remember animating on projects like star wars mass kanata which was full keyframe by the way or mm -hmm. um rocket or I don't know, age of ultron hulk whatever i remember shooting reference and getting that into maya but sometimes i was matching close but sometimes i was like mm, that doesn't really work with this character so i have to change it but it, it helps me to get where i need to get quicker mm -hmm. it's a tool for me and i think you know, in the old Disney as well, uh, Nine Old Men, they were looking at reference as well, sometimes really close for yeah. realistic humans and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes there was exaggeration, right? So it's, again, I go back to the same thing. I'm going to repeat myself a bit, but like, then it's a dial thing. Like how much you want to stay close to that reference, how much mm -hmm. you want to base and exaggerate. It's all question of the character, style. Um, yeah, all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. 40 references at a time. Have you yes. done more than that sometimes? Or is 40 the, the cap that you've done yet? <laughs> Probably in one shot before even placing a key, looking at it with a piece of shot with an animator. I think it was 35 close to 40, something like that, something around there. Like there were so many references. It was like, you know, I think that was the maximum I saw in my life in one Jeez, shot. Jeez, yeah. I'm just thinking about your eyeballs going like this. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And especially with dogs, wow. Um, do you have any book recommendation or YouTube videos that you can give? For sure, for sure. I think um, book recommendations is something that will go to everyone, for sure. Everybody knows this, I'm sure. But like Animator Survival Kid, you know, Illusion of Life, they're really good books and you should go for it. But also there are some other books about storytelling and etc. Like there was one, oh my God, what was the name of it? Um, in the, I think it was In the Blink of an Eye. I think it was called In the oh, Blink of Oh my God. I, I think think I, yeah, I think I do know what you're talking about. I think I have. Oh, when I, I think, was it this one, the editor? No, I think it's about editing. Um, uh, editor. I'm going to get back to you on this if you don't mind. No, yeah, you're totally okay. I think, yeah, I, think I have that in my notes because I think um, Nicole Hare also mentioned that hold on in the in the blink oh. of an eye a perspective of film editing yep there we go oh, uh, okay. that book is quite an interesting one because 
even though it was about movie editing, it gives you something about character acting and stuff like that because it talks about how editors don't cut in the middle of a blink. They, they, it's an, it's a very interesting thing. You won't find one where they're halfway closed like that or something. And it's because yeah. clearly, I mean, it's a lovely read actually. I would definitely highly recommend it for you to read. But the essence of it is about for us humans, in a way, mm -hmm. blinking is a cut point for our thought process, literally. So if you ask me a question and I absorb a bit because I'm thinking and then I do that, it's almost like, oh, what was it, 2008? I did this. And you know what I mean? Like there's a blink there and just change my thought process from absorbing <laughs> the question to thinking about the answer. So it's a very interesting idea and I really like that. It was just a nice read as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously at Catmull's uh, Creative Inc., uh, Creativity Inc., I think that would, I will definitely recommend this. There's also... Um, quite a few YouTube channels I really enjoy watching and following. One of them is called Just an Observation. Uh, if you're a big fan of Succession like me, I found this gentleman uh, via Succession completely because I love this TV show. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed because Succession was a TV show for me that I almost didn't watch it, literally. Oh. When I first started to watch it, I was like, these characters are too caricature. It's like, yeah. do I want to watch this? And then once I got in, get into it i was like oh my god it's great and then there's all this deep thinking and etc but just an observation this channel there are a lot of videos about how rogan roy the main character for example <laughs> he acts and the guy is not an, an animator i think he just loves filmmaking and storytelling and oh story got it yeah screenplay so he just like digs the performances or he breaks down his acting scene from that tv show right and lots of other tv shows as well <laughs> But it's so valuable for us animators because you look at that and, you know, uh, and I tell this to my students a lot, by the way, and I do some uh, scene, acting scene breakdowns, but I tell them, watch a lot of live action movies as well. And also, you know, I watch really just VFX heavy movies just to empty my brain or whatever, but watch good movies. And then when you watch a good movie or a TV show, if you like a scene, go back and watch it again. Go back and watch it and try to understand why it hit a chord with you. What What is it? And that will help you again. It, 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 I think this whole thing, so for, to, to be perfectly honest, I, when I, as an animator, uh, for me, the uh, body mechanics and physicality came first and acting came later. For me, exaggerated acting was, was good. Like, you know, like, how you do it or whatever, yeah. Yeah, which there's a place for that. But I thought that was acting. But then something kicked in and somewhere and i started to think and dig more and that came from practice being mm -hmm. surrounded by good people mm -hmm. but watching good movies good animated movies but good live action movies right and it, it really develops your brain and it's something clicked in so i because of that i really encourage people to go back and watch these those scenes again mm -hmm. another good one i really enjoy is nerd writer nerd writer mm -hmm. one, i think his youtube channel's name is again is a writer guy uh, mm -hmm. But he does a lot of acting scene breakdowns and stuff like that, but also, oh. you know, movie breakdowns and storytelling. So why a movie works or not, but something like that. There is another chap called, uh, I think it's called Filmento, which is usually does why a movie doesn't work. But what he does is not scene, scene specific but, uh, or acting specific. It's more like the storytelling perspective. And I think okay. sometimes oh, I even that. movies that you enjoy watching, yeah. A bit, makes you feel a bit empty or like not sorry it feels you like oh i didn't understand why it didn't connect but yeah yes. it, was, it was an okay movie but you then you watch that guy's videos and it's like oh because of the story it doesn't work with this and then that doesn't make sense and actually that's why it doesn't work mm -hmm. it's really breaking those down really nicely so i really enjoy those channels i think i could come back to you a few more but those are the first ones literally comes to my mind oh wow and um oh we were oh oh so, have you seen the video of an interview of Steve Steven Spielberg where he uh, talks about why everyone should start off as an animator first and then go into becoming a director, becoming a writer? Have you seen that video? I didn't actually, but it's not. Okay. Uh, it's ringing a bell. I mean, it makes sense in a funny way. Um, I was say, yeah, can you explain? Because I was watching that video and it was so interesting because I wanted to be a director first, but then mm -hmm. I discovered animation. I was like, oh, and obviously I hooked onto animation, but I just, I was like, oh, why is, why does he think that? He explained it, but I just thought that I've never heard of that um, 
that perspective that mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't watch that video but I think the reason I could imagine behind it is because animation is storytelling right mm-hmm. I always tell my students as well where um even you know for introduction to acting like I know you want to go and just animate something but think about what is happening the shot before and the shot after mm-hmm. like I recently uh, a film editor a picture editor told me a very nice thing he said like for a movie a movie starts on frame 1 right mm-hmm. first frame of the film he says what happened before frame 1 but he is literally thinking the same thing for editorial right mm-hmm. so animation you have to act, acting uh, as an actor i think they they have an amazing job and they do it real time at that moment with the pressures of the schedule director light everything but an animator it has to do those things in slow motion right they have to really think about the storytelling every pose needs to have a purpose mm-hmm. everything it's that's the biggest thing everything you're doing in animation needs to have a purpose you can't just like one of the things i tell my students okay you animated this like that whatever but like what's the purpose what, what does it give to you for a scene right. you know what i mean like uh, one of my students one day like i told him to, to pick up a letter to start to read and he did something like like this and i'm like why it it doesn't serve you for the story it might have a nice right. arc you know right. what i mean so when you have a purpose for a motion or an eye dart or everything that a lot it does the core of everything so you're you can develop that, that applies to writing that applies to directing every single shot needs to have a purpose so i think everything comes from there and gets bigger so mm-hmm. i would imagine and i'm sure he's a fantastic director and he would have maybe even different perspective than what i'm saying here but what i can see and really empathize is um is really animation is very similar like why you have that shot in your movie as a director mm-hmm. does do you really need that shot or that right. scene do you know what yeah. i mean sometimes scenes you know beautifully animated or beautifully shot or whatever doesn't right. add anything to the film right and that is a that's the same thing as an a- animator when you animate something it's like yeah um he's going to he's going to pick pick a piece of paper but does he have to do like this what does mm-hmm. that add to that scene nothing right so it's the it's the all about like making those choices so i think it educates you making about choices and the right choices maybe and i think you can take that experience to writing directing and everything i'm just guessing here what I, i'm not sure and i'm going to try to find a video i'm really impressed from that um, yeah. but yeah yeah that would be nice awesome. thing right yeah giving it purpose it makes it more real honestly when you think and you know give every single step a purpose every single think about it then it all start then it all really makes sense i like exactly. that exactly exactly mm-hmm. Exactly. So, how important is drawing as an animator? As a CG animator, I have to be brutal honest. Look, I, if I say here drawing is not important, people will, um, you know, um, throw stones on me or whatever, you know, something like that. <laughs> But of course, drawing is very important. I won't say the opposite. But I think, for example, I'm a great drawer, and everybody knows in the company as well. Neither. <laughs> But the thing is, I, you know, line of I can draw a line of action, I can explain things, I can draw the spacing, and etc. So the more you do that, so for example, at least in my case, mm-hmm. um, getting a stronger posing and stuff that really came from for me from observation. Like I can look at a piece, I can look at you know just look at myself in the mirror for that pose. or a reference or an actor or a, you know something that physical a sportsman doing or whatsoever yeah. i can literally look at that and in cg i can see where oh. the chest needs to be or where the arm or shoulder yeah. needs to be. immediately i can click on that and that's just me but i oh, think yeah. even i could use more drawing skills for sure so i will i think it's quite important but it's not the maybe the most essential one but it's something for sure and i underline this for sure yeah. something you shouldn't abandon or think oh it's okay i don't need to do it i would say mm-hmm. definitely 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 do it because i think it will also um apart from life drawing and stuff like this if you lots of people continue drawing and they it really helps them to find different styles have fun empty your brain is it's, it's a great i think hobby even just even like as a side thing do you know what i mean so i would really really recommend it wow yeah you don't have to be the best drawer but you do no. have to know how to draw I think this is the biggest thing between 2D and 3D animation. In the 2D animation, you really really have to draw really 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 well, yeah. and on top of that, you really have to understand motion. Mm-hmm. But I think CG animation probably rightly or wrongly separated that a little bit and it's just like, okay, do you understand the motion? Do you understand the acting? But then, you know, understanding those things help will help you all the time because 
Um, but like I said, for me, it was just a obs um, observation thing that I could mm -hmm. see the pose from the shoulders and stuff like that. Like, so I don't. I, but I think it still helps you with many, many things. For example, um, you know, I tell this to my students. Even like I try to do little two D animations in my iPad or my iPad. Yeah. And it's like, it teaches you something. And it's like squat from squash and stretch into this to that. And again, it goes back to the same thing as I was telling you. It's a question of dial, how much you want to push it. Because um, when a character, um, you know, um, if he's going to be surprised, you know, in a cartoony way, he could go like really, you can squash the head and like close the eyes and then open them like this. And oh, the same yeah. rule could easily apply in a more believable, I dare to say realistic, but a believable way. You could just close the eyes, eyebrows a bit, and close the jaw. So, so that's a squash as well. It just you don't squash the whole face, but you squash the eyebrows and you close yeah. the mouth. You can you can have the same thing without going too extreme. And these things you will learn and practice from having all these skills a little bit and combine into one. Mm -hmm. And the more experience you have with all of these things, the more you can reflect those choices in your mm -hmm. animation. I don't know if yeah. that makes yeah. Yeah. That all makes sense. Yeah. And so when you have a vision in your head, what is the process that you take to make that vision come to life? Uh, for a vision, for the, for a, can you repeat the question one more time for me? Yeah. How do you make a vision come to life? Anything that's in your head, whether it's, um, just a short little scene. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So that's a, that's a very good question. I think majority of, of course, I start with what happens in the scene. Mm -hmm. If I'm animating the shot myself, what happens in the shot and what is the character going through? What is the, and I get this information from my supervisor, if not from a director, or we get it from a director brief. Yeah. And then I, I, I genuinely usually start to shoot video reference for the performances. And I, I do, on that stage, I work really fast and really dirty actually. And I am not a stepped animator, like step key animator. So I don't do my blocks in stepped. I oh, usually okay. keep it as fine. Yeah. Rough poses, but everything fluid fluidity works really well. And from my reference, I might I might look at my reference, but then I usually with the character and the camera angle, I might yeah. change the pose and push the push the poses and stuff like this. And then I watch it and I watch it in the sequence immediately. I don't watch it by itself. I immediately <laughs> put it into the edit and I look at it in the edit. That's because you might just fall in love with looking animate first of all, animation is fun moving things around is fun and you might just animate something and you you feel like oh my god that's a great thing to animate uh, that's a nice animation but yeah. when you play the cut what happens before and after it immediately will give you an effect maybe you animated too much maybe you exaggerated too much maybe the tone is off a bit because of the scene and the heaviness of the scene or whatever do you know what i mean um so for example i did a shot on age of ultron i remember really well um where he was like really his face was all broken i think he just bombs Hulk and Scarlett Johansson. And mm -hmm. then there's a shot of him and he he sings that Pinocchio song. Uh, I can't remember the lyric, lyrics now. I don't yeah. know. Uh, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> it's literally when, and it's a very interesting thing. I was just saying this to my students actually last weekend mm -hmm. that um, where your character is mm -hmm. going to dictate some of your acting choices. So in this case, mm -hmm. this character is on a plane flying. Yeah. You know, he's not going to stand up and like give a monologue. Do you know right. what I mean? He has yeah, to fly yeah. away, right? And he just flew over. So he's going to look up, look over there. And, and then he's by himself and he's like, he's very happy with himself, slightly cocky, the nose is up and, you know, he's singing with a little bit with the tune of this delivery. So it immediately will dictate what you can do and cannot do. So I think about those things. What is my limitations? Where's my character? So I tell my students, okay, there's a lot of dialogue you're going to animate, but mm -hmm. what is the environment? Is she having a, okay, let's say that it's an argument with the husband, by all, okay. is this. Is she in the swimming pool? Is mm -hmm. she having, having a sun bath? Is she in the bar? Are mm -hmm. they arguing in the bed? Did she just come from the off work and she's at the corridor she, of the hall? Where is she? Yeah, is she yeah. drinking and she hears something that her husband says pisses him off? Where, where, mm -hmm. where are they? That will dictate so much information. Um, so I really think about that. And then I think about the emotions. That's so important. So. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, of course, some universal things that you can think about for a character to feel in a particular emotion. But then I also consider a lot the head angle, tilt, and the neck, because that tells a lot about a character's 
uh, intention with you. Do you know what I mean? If, if someone, there's this scene I love from the movie called Foxcatcher, for example, where Steve Carell is playing. It. It's a good movie, isn't it? Yes. And there's a scene when Channing Tatum comes in for the first time in the trophy room and they talk. And you can yeah. see, you can see, it's just, it's just decisions, right? Like, I, and I tell them, I, I show this to my students, not because it's the earth shattering stuff maybe for them. It's, it's not the most famous movie in the world neither. So some people don't even know it, but like Channing Tatum sits down and he's like, he's like this, he's like, He's a big guy. He can really sit he's like that. Yeah. But he's like this. He's defensive. And then you look at Steve Carell. He's like, he puts he's his arm around the sofa. His nose is up. It just gives, tells you everything without saying a single word. Ah. So one of them is uncomfortable. He doesn't know what to do here. The other one is like, I'm the boss. I'm a bit arrogant as well. <laughs> yes. Says you know? the just tone. There. You can really tell. Oh. Exactly. And of course, there are complexities on top of all these things, right? Yes. I mean, for sure. And it, even deeper acting choices we can talk about. But there are a lot of things I think and question, whereas my characters, was the emotion, um, you know, and to be honest, with performance stuff, particularly, mm -hmm. when you even look somewhere, it tells a lot. So I remember um, we were shooting video reference for Baby Groot on Guardians 2, and uh, he was just tortured. Um, after the ravagers throw all this alcohol on him and it gets wet and all that. Yeah. Um, and then you see Yondu and Rocket in the prison cell and you just see that baby Groot just like super wet, just like walking, right? So yeah. you look at that and it's like, look here, that's a good example. How is he going to walk? Well, he's just depressed. He's just been tortured. He's not going to run, is he? He's not no. going to be chilly and like, I mean, he might do that, but that's another story. In yeah, this case, is. he's depressed and sad. So he's walking really slow, slow steps. So a longer time for the weight shift and the head is down. It's just looking down. It's just because when you're sad, you just get to go through your own thoughts. So that dictates all that information immediately to the performance. Um, and then you should take reference like that. And then you try to adapt that to your character's proportions and all that jazz. But that's another challenge. But how I start is literally thinking about all these questions and feed that into the um, into the performance. Yeah, wow, and there's so many questions. There's so many, but then you eventually find the answer. I mm -hmm. love Foxcatcher. I thought that movie was incredible. Um, my I dad showed me it, and I was like, oh, I don't wanna, if it's not a funny movie, I don't wanna watch it. <laughs> then, cause Jenny Tatum and Steve Carell, yeah. and I watched it and I was like, I'm so happy you showed me that movie. Mark mm -hmm. Ruffalo as well, he's like, the oh, they're brothers, God. right? Mark Ruffalo and Channing Tatum are brothers in, in the real life story. And they're like different. They're so different characters. One of them is a lot more social with people. The other one yeah. is more He just can't even have eye contact. And those choices are just choices, but for a reason. And it's yeah, great. Yeah, for a reason. It's not, exactly. It's mm -hmm. nothing just by accident. It's by design. And I think yeah. digging that is a good fun, um, uh, fun what's the word, uh, exercise, but also very teaching. Very, you know, it's a learning experience, I think. Oh, yeah, the thing, how you can tell a story, not just through the writing is yeah. incredible. That's why yeah. just the entire film industry is so fun because you can tell a story really. just through however. Yeah. Um, so yeah. please tell us the process of getting your first job, whether you just finished school or sure. you're still in school, but have some experience that you feel ready enough to do an internship or a job. Sure. I mean, if I talk about my really, really, really first job, uh, that's yeah. a different story. It's like in, I, because my first job was a, a composing artist. But if you talk about animation, like pure animation like this, which I really want to talk about that, it was an interesting experience. So <laughs> okay. I was working as a flame artist and right. I was a freelancer at some point, but I was really into animation. So there was no resources like today. So I was just making a show reel. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm going to really show my age. Uh, I think I started with VHS, VHS tapes. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was wow. like costing me an arm and a leg because I really wanted the reels to go to the companies I'm applying and I want to make sure they received it. So I was sending them by FedEx or DHL. It was costing me an arm and a leg because I was from Jeez. Turkey. Um, then it turned into CD, uh, DVDs, I think. So DVDs. But that was like a, from 2000. Two, I think, or at, at the end of 2001 or two, or maybe beginning of two. And it went until 2003, middle of 2003. And I think every six months I was updating my reel. I was just getting rejections. Ah. Then I, uh, one day I got an answer 
and they wanted me to do a test on, I think they were using a different software. I was on Maya, they were on Lightway. I did a test and I was accepted. I worked there for a year, it was a games company, but mm -hmm. I wasn't very happy, not because of the company was bad or anything like that. Actually, everyone who worked in that company went to really good places afterwards, mm -hmm. but the project wasn't moving forward and I was just like restless a bit. I was too young, maybe too stupid, I don't know. But like, <laughs> I quit my job. And I went back to Istanbul, actually. I kept working as a freelancer and I kept updating my reel every six months. But I really want to work in film. So I was applying from Pixar to Framestore to Animal Logic to lots of places. Mm -hmm. And I remember every now and then, either I get a reply saying that they don't want to do my visa or I was rejected. Oh, right. I was working visa, work visa. Right. Um, and eventually uh, something happened with Framestore and they said they really liked my reel, but they felt like there wasn't a position suitable for me. And I was so frustrated. Yeah, that's six months more passed or eight. I don't remember. I do remember the date though. It was 2006 February. I made my latest reel and I said it everywhere. And I said, that's it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to go and sell lemons or something. I just, yeah. Yeah, whatever. This is like a journey, right? So I'm just telling you very in a short, compact time. And I got a job offer just for a, a month in mm. Portugal to work on a, a game cinematic. Hey. By, location, by location and I went over there it was great I was staying in this beautiful villa uh, upstairs there were a couple of people like me who was not from uh, Portugal but we could stay in the villa and downstairs the big living room was like 20 artists 25 artists doing this cinematic it was really nice mm -hmm. every day after 6 p.m. is a true story and it's really funny at 6 p.m. you know I got a beer and just like look at the internet so back then I had a Yahoo email account uh -huh. every now and then I was checking my uh, junk folder, spam folder, and I clicked on it, and I saw this subject saying that your availability, and I thought uh, probably it's a spam, but yeah. I'll it. I was a very short email saying that, hey, we really like your reel, and we were curious about your availability, and let us know start dates, potential. I was like, but no, no company name. So I went to the from section, and it was from Framestore. Now, Frame Store was somewhere that I really loved because they were doing a lot more creature character heavy stuff oh. in London. And um, it was a big company um, and it was close to my home. So I could travel mm -hmm. from Europe to my home it went easier than America. And they accepted it. But if I didn't look at that email that day, I would have a very different life, probably. Maybe not. I don't know. But also... It's the question of every six months, updating my reel, sending it again, getting rejections, getting rejections. So I just didn't give up. And that's my biggest thing. And I think I took any kind of job I could do work because I think that will teach you a lot about real life production environment. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. It will be a good experience. You will sometimes yeah. have bad experiences, sometimes good. Sometimes there will be naughty people, uh, nasty people in the office whatever, but like, it doesn't matter. Like you'll learn from all these experiences and exactly. that's something you cannot buy in life. So that's why I highly recommend to, you know, but also don't give up. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very, I'm very lucky in that, in those terms. So since then I've been living and working in London, I moved around a bit. I worked in ILM and PC, Prime Focus, but I came back to Framestore and since 2016, I'm working as an animation supervisor in Framestore. Oh. What an incredible journey, jeez. So, so from 2000, you started applying in 2001 and then 2006? Uh, well, 2002, beginning of 2002, I think okay. I started to apply properly. And then 2000, middle of 2003, mm -hmm. I got my first job offer. Oh, um, okay. well, actually, you know what? No, oh my God. I got, a, I got an interview in 2003, March, for mm -hmm. the company that still exists, great company, Access Studios. Uh, in Scotland, and they mm -hmm. they got me. A, they even got my work permit, but the project was cancelled after one month. Ugh. So I got a job, but I couldn't go. And then, yeah. at the end of two thousand three, September, I got this job offer for this game company, right. a games company. And um, you know, there there I was. But it's it's interesting. Like, but that wasn't where I want to end up working all the time. I really want yeah. to work on film, mm -hmm. in film. And uh, I just didn't didn't stop uh, applying, improving, and you know it was never easy. And even when I was in Frame Store, there were challenges and places. Sometimes I felt like I can't improve enough, or this or that. But always keep an open eye, open mind, okay. and um, you know keep keep try to keep improving. I think that's the most important thing you can do in this business. Yeah, and be okay with rejection. Oh my goodness, the amount of stories I hear of, not just one, not just two, not even just three rejections, multiple back to back to back, do not give up. 
I didn't that's know that. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> Even from the past um, interviews that I was doing, I was like, you guys are so talented. How could they, how could these companies, how could, you know, just anyone reject you that much? But it's just, you know, you have to yeah. be okay with rejection and just don't give up. <laughs> exactly. That's the key thing. And I think, and, and you be realistic as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I was saying. Okay, I, I got rejected. Okay, but that's, I think it's very hard. But always try to have a objective eye for your work. So when I when I was doing every six months, I was updating my reel or eight months or whatever. I was like, I like this shot, but you know what? It's not good enough. I think I'm gonna take this out. I'm gonna replace it with this. Talk mm -hmm. to your colleagues and stuff like that as well. But always, always, always be very objective and how you can make that reel better. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very key thing. So you have to be a bit brutal with your own work and sometimes just like take it apart and put new stuff because you improve. Like. If you continue working, even if you animate at home by yourself, if you continue yeah. doing this, if you exercise, literally, you're going to mm -hmm. continue getting better. And therefore, something you had done one and a half years ago might not be as good as you would what you would do now. And you will always be judged with your weakest work, actually, in a funny way, in a real. Mm -hmm. So always think about that and be brutal yeah. about your work. So sometimes shorter is better, actually, in those terms. Right. Wow, yeah. And... What is some advice that you can give to animators just starting out, those sure. that are just about to give up, just any advice? Sure. I think, like I said before, don't, I mean, it's a journey. Yeah. Take it with us, take it with your own stride. There is no, I think one of the other things I would highly recommend, which I did as a big mistake, I compared myself a lot to other people in the past. I still do sometimes, but it's not the yeah. best thing in the world. I think you should always compare yourself to yourself. And that's the important yes. thing. And then mm. be okay with rejections. They will happen. That's not against you. That's not to your personality. It's just the work. But also be very objective. I think I'm repeating myself a bit, but it's very true with your own show reel. And be prepared. If you get rejections in the next few months, for example, you might be like, okay, what can I do better here? You know, maybe get a uh, private tutor or like talk to your colleagues or someone you know who works in the industry get their opinion what you can change in this reel what is what you can do better and the other thing is there's always this thing which is very true think about mm -hmm. the company you're going to apply for and make your yeah. reel accordingly Based if you really yeah. want to work in a games company they will like to see lots of cycles and stuff like that that's for sure mm -hmm. but at the same time you know for example for film um it depends on the company as well. Like Framestore, one of the reasons I really love working in Framestore is also we do a lot of character-oriented work, even though it's for live action. Stuff yeah. like Paddington, Rocket, or all that stuff. But the, uh, you know, if the company you're applying for, they do a lot of very hyper-real animals, for mm -hmm. example, it would be very good to have one or two very solid pieces of very realistic animal animation okay. based on real reference because that's what they use a lot, right? So if, if you can show and demonstrate that you can do that, that's good. If you want to have a reel that covers the basics a lot more, and that's the biggest thing we look for, is some spark. What do I mean by that is, there are, that's, there's a fact, there's a lot of competition in the industry, for sure, for students and new grads. But the thing what we're looking for, not only you can move things around, but you, can you make it believable? Now, I'm mm. not saying realistic, but believable. Yeah. It could be exaggerated, but right. am I really f feeling the weight of this object? Or mm -hmm. if you're doing an acting piece, it's just not very cliche and it's something unique or mm -hmm. it feels sincere. Do you know what I oh. mean? It's just an over the top yes. performance, but it feels really sincere. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a one, even this one, and it doesn't have to be the most believe uh, realistic thing ever, do we have a quadruped animation? It will be good to show that you can do mm -hmm. that as well. But that's more like a general show reel general, I almost dare to say generalist animator show reel. Yeah. It's a weird word to say. But yeah, you can fine tune it depending on where you want to go with your life. If you right. really want to work in the games industry, um, of course, you need to have cycles or looping stuff, idols and stuff like that to show mm -hmm. that you can animate them. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on where you want to go and you can fine tune the reel. And like I said, don't don't get don't get this, this encouraged from this. Just It's a process. You will never know where because it's, it's a bit of luck as well like where you are with what real in what time of your life and what project is kicking off on that in that company there's a mm. lot of variables that you cannot always control actually right. you cannot control at all the only thing you can control is your show reel and do the yeah. best and just you know keep like finding from finding nemo like dory says just keep swimming 
<laughs> just keep swimming. Keep just keep going. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. You just you just mentioned a word, a quadra, a quadra. Really? Quadrupeds. Yeah, like a four-legged animal, like a tiger,、oh. like a cat, like a dog. Quadra. Oh, it's my accent, probably, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, quad means four. I thought it was a specific type of. I was like, what kind of? What is that? Oh, I understand. Okay, but. <laughs>、uh, Awesome! Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all the advice, all the experience, all the stories that you were telling today. They're gonna help a lot. And yeah, just thank you so much for your time. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much indeed. Have a lovely, have a lovely weekend. And、uh, thanks for having me. Of course, anytime. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of the Animators Blueprint. Our heartfelt gratitude goes out to Animation Mentor for sponsoring our podcast. To show our appreciation, we invite you to visit animationmentor.com forward slash podcast. Here, you can download a complimentary animation ebook. It's packed with valuable insights for animators at every level. It's our gift to you for subscribing. Keep animating your world, and we'll see you in the next episode. Stay creative.